All right, so um, thank you all for making it down to the dungeon. Uh, my name is Dylan Kearns, and I'm an ELM trainer and coach. Um, I help people improve their ELM code bases and make them more manageable at Incremental ELM Consulting. And today I'm going to be talking about using semantic types to squash bugs. And really this type, this uh, talk, I'm glad, glad I waited a few minutes to let everybody trickle in here. So really this talk is about um, what kinds of guarantees can we get from, from a type system? So um, you know, many of us working with functional typed languages um, love the guarantees we get that when we're working with a typed language, we, we know that we're guaranteed to have desirable state because we've kind of expressed our algebraic data types that say these are the possible states. We've written our types in such a way that it's not possible to express certain states. And so we can kind of at a glance see what states are possible, are all these states valid, and be confident that our data can only be in a desirable state. And that's great. Um, but this talk really explores the question, can we also get guarantees from the type system that that data that's in a nice shape is also used in a desirable way? So maybe we've got some um, perfectly well-brewed tea, but how do we make sure that it's going to be poured in a desirable way? <laughs> so this talk is going to explore kind of using the type system and API design to sort of guide data to be used correctly and give us guarantees about that. So um, this talk is going to be doing a lot of live coding and going to be using the Elm programming language, which if, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's just a language for building front-end web applications. It's a pure, functional, statically typed language. And it's got this really neat design called the Elm architecture. So the Elm architecture is how data and side effects happen in an Elm application. Um, it's not an optional plugin. It's just how Elm apps are. And uh, here's a high-level overview of this uh, pretty simple but very elegant design. So um, at the core is your model, which represents the entire state of your application. This is all of the data. It's not the data for one component. It's the data for the entire application. Could be any complex data type that you define. Um, and then you have messages. These are the events that can occur in your application. So if a user clicks a button, presses a key, if an HTTP response returns, these are all events that come into your system and, um, and affect your application state. So in the Elm architecture, uh, for example, here's an Elm app where we're just doing a simple increment counter. We click the plus one button and you can see the flow of the data. It, um, this message plus, so the little diamonds there are Elm messages. So this plus message flows through the Elm runtime. Um, along with our current application state, our current model, which is 42. Um, again, it could be any data type. In this case, it's just an int. Um, and so that data, the message that occurred and the, the current model gets passed into the update function, which is a function that we define in our code to tell Elm how to transition our data and perform side effects when a message comes in. So since plus came in, we say, okay, please change the application state, our model, by doing this transformation. So now the model is 43. That new model gets passed through to the Elm runtime where it's able to keep track of our current application state, gets through to the view function, which we define. And our view function is just a pure function where the input is the current application state and the output is the HTML for our entire application. So we return that view and the Elm runtime does its virtual DOM diffing magic to figure out which pieces to change in the DOM to make the, uh, to make the page look how it's supposed to. And then we get uh, an incremented counter to 43. So that's the Elm architecture in a nutshell. Um, so here's the app we're going to be working on for this session. So we've got 
A very simple form, you can imagine that this is a part of a very complex application where we've got some intricate wizard. Um, but for our purposes, you'll have to use your imagination. Um, so the user enters a social security number. Um, it, could be, it could be partial, it could be complete. Um, but the important thing is that we need to be able to make sure that this is used securely. So if it loses focus, then we're gonna mask that number. Um, and then we, uh, we submit it to a server and uh, we get a little check mark saying that it's persisted. So now if I open up an incognito window and open it, we get this masked social security number that we inputted. Um, if I put it in focus, then we can see it and edit it. Um, but if I take it out of focus, then it's masked. So that's the core logic. But uh, there's a problem with our application, uh, which is that it's masked, and that logic is working perfectly. Um, we focus it, and it's unmasked. But when we click Submit, we're actually seeing the unmasked number here. Um, and that's a bug. And um, it's, bugs are annoying, but this bug uh, is critical and could have legal ramifications. Maybe we have a huge fine or lose a lot of trust from our users if we introduce a bug like this. So this is, a, this is something that's very important that we can be confident is not going to happen in our application. Um, so with that said, let's, let's see what it feels like to try to, to, try to fix this bug. Uh, now, um, I've got a little Elm debugger, which is just a little tool to, to help kind of see the application state. So. Um, it's pretty nifty. You can kind of you can kind of walk back through um, any state that your application has been through because it's just a pure function to take it from the current model to uh, to render the view function. So it can just keep track of what your various model states have been, and you can tick through it, and you can see all of the messages that have um, that have affected that application state. So if I click submit, uh, uh, if I click submit here. And we see the bug. Um, if I go to my uh, debugger view, then I can see there's this submit social security number event that's occurring, this message that's going through our app. So let's take a look in our app for the um, submit social security number message. So here's the definition of message. It's just a simple algebraic data type. Um, so submit social security number. So if I look through my code for where su submit social security number is used, I can see here um, this is the update function. So this is the, um, this is the part of the code that's responsible for changing my application state and for performing side effects. So in this case, um, popping up that little window that had the unmasked social security number is a side effect because it's, it's actually just telling JavaScript to do that. So, um, okay, I've navigated that code pretty easily. Uh, I was able to find this uh, piece of code. Let's go and um, mask this input. Uh, so we've got a social security number here. When we're, we're, when we're performing this command, we're telling Elm, please submit the social security number with status. Okay, so um, I've got a little helper function to mask a social security number. So let's try this again. Okay, and sure enough, it's masked. And now we're getting a new error. So what's going on here? Well, uh, let's open up our little debug console in Chrome. Uh, and it looks like it's making an API request now where we have a masked social security number. So, so what's, what's going on here? Um, we've fixed one bug, but we've introduced another. So um, if, we, if we look at our data types a little bit here, um, we, can, we can follow through the logic of submit social security number with status. So what, what argument does it take? It takes a string. What, what is that string? Well, it's called SSN. So, I mean, what does that mean? Is it supposed to be masked or unmasked? It's hard to say, but it's actually, it's actually batching together two side effects here. It's sending it to the server and it's showing the little dialog box, right? So it turns out, you know, this isn't rocket science. We can kind of follow the flow of our application and figure out all the places. The, the problem is 
um, we really have to follow the entire flow of our application in order to have confidence of that. And if you imagine many different pages and modules um, and people working on this code that, that, can, that we have to keep track of these different rules, um, I'm not feeling very confident that this bug is going to be fixed um, and, gonna, and is going to stay fixed, right? And, and really the problem right here is we just have all of these strings. So submit social security number with status, it takes a string. I mean, what, what does that mean? What, what does that string represent? Is it, is it masked? Is it unmasked? Is it encrypted? Is it unencrypted? Um, send social security number to server. What's, what's that supposed to be, right? So uh, we don't really know what, we're taking in these arguments, but we don't really know what they, the underlying data represents without following the entire execution path. So it becomes a very imperative debugging process. So, so how do we guard our logic? So we need to convince our legal team that this isn't going to happen again because they're putting a lot of pressure on us uh, that there's going to be a gigantic fine if this happens and we're going to lose a lot of users. So, um, so ultimately, we want, we want confidence. We want confidence that um, there aren't going to be security issues. We want confidence also that there just aren't going to be bugs. And we want confidence that it's going to be easy for somebody to ramp up on the team or come to an area of code they're not familiar with or just haven't, haven't worked in, in for a while um, and are not going to have to take a lot of time or effort to, to do the right thing. Um, so what are some possible solutions to help? Well, um, we could add some tests. And testing is a very useful tool. Um, and it helps give confidence in a lot of ways. But tests only test what we tell them to. They only test what we remember to test. And in this case, perhaps we didn't remember to write a test for this particular instance. So I don't think that's going to convince the legal team. We could make sure in code review, we could even add a checklist um, to make sure whenever you're dealing with social security numbers, double check your logic. But again, this, this doesn't fundamentally change my confidence level. It just incrementally makes me feel slightly more confident that there's another checkpoint in place. So, you know, overall, I, I'm really not confident that it's going to stay fixed with these solutions. So let's look a little bit about at the application flow. So what's, what's going on in our application? Well, we've got... Um, We've got this data that's stored in our model, which is sort of the um, social security number input from our user. It, it could be partially complete or it could be uh, empty. It could be a completed uh, social security number. Um, so how can we get this data into the model? Um, well, when we, when we initially load the page, um, we have to give our Elm application an initial state. So from our init function in our Elm application, it's giving it some state for it to initially store in the model. Um, if we've already saved a social security number, then when we load it from the server, it can get data from there. And then uh, the user can type into the input field, and that will end up sending some messages that will result in our model being updated as well. So those are sort of the three ways that you can get this data representing the social security number input. And then we can use it um, in a few different ways. When we look at it, we can, uh, we can save it to the server. We can show status. And then we can just kind of show the input to the user. So these are the ways that, that I can use this data. Um, so it, it kind of flows through a little bit like this. We load the data. Um, it goes through and gets stored in the model. Um, and then... Um, when we're, when we're using it, when we save it, we, uh, we don't mask it. When we show the status, we do mask it. And when we show the input, depending on whether it's in focus or not, we will mask it or not. Um, and then new data can flow through and the same rules apply. So, so that's kind of a high level overview of, what, of what's going on. And again, um, when, we, when we look at all of these, um, all of these points in the code, uh, when we look at our init function, we, we see a string. Um, 
Now it's it's a little more obvious what that represents in our uh, what that represents in our init function because it's an empty string. But um, if we look through our code to show status and all these other areas, um, we just see all these strings and we don't really know what they represent. Um, it, it's just a string. So it's, it's really not being clear about what the semantics are of that type. Um, so let me introduce um, Sorry, it's a little tricky to flip between code and slides here. Um, so let me introduce um, just a very simple concept of a wrapper type. Um, I, I don't know if that's an official term, but that's what I think of them as. So um, here we've got a little bit, a little snippet of Elm code that's uh, kind of defining a side effect. So we can get profile. It's going to make an HTTP request based on these two strings, a user ID and an auth token. And then we take our user ID. Um, and we pass that in for get profile, and then, oh, we take the auth token, but uh, we forgot to pass it into the right place, and there's no compiler error here. It's, we're, we're going to find out about this down the line when we're running our code and saying what the heck is going on. So um, we could use a little technique of introducing a wrapper type. So let's say, let's take our user ID and our auth token and just do a very simple wrapper. So really nothing has changed structurally about the data, but we've represented the meaning of these data types by wrapping the strings in just these names, user ID and auth token. And then we use that in our signatures here. And uh, suddenly we have, um, user ID and auth token, and we're crossing our wires here, and we get a compiler error. So um, pretty handy for kind of making sure that things represent what you think they represent. And uh, it gives you a level of safety, even though it doesn't structurally change the data you're representing or the states that you can model, it helps you get confidence with the wiring, and it helps you reason about your code because you've kind of clued in the, the reader of the code to the semantics of what you mean. So it's nice for humans. Um, OK, so with that technique in mind of these wrapper types, let's try to squash some bugs. And uh, let's feel like badasses like this astronaut when we're doing it. So uh, our goal is that we want to change one type in a single place in our code. And then we want to fix compiler errors. And the only changes I'm going to be making in the code are going to be directly addressing something that the compiler is telling me I need to do. So it's going to be completely compiler driven. And then we're going to have no more bugs. So that's, that's the dream here. Um, in order to try to do that, we're going to follow two simple rules. We're going to wrap early, and we're going to unwrap late. So what does that mean? Um, so wrapping early gives us a way of kind of saying, what does this data represent? And, and not only saying what it represents, like our user ID and our auth token. It has a wrapper. But by wrapping early, yes? Um, so what I'm typing is for Ah, that's a great question. Would a type alias work? So a type alias um, gives the um, it gives the human a clue when you annotate in your type signature. So for example, if we look at um, these wrapper types here, um, if we use type aliases instead of types here, then um, the human reading it could say, oh, this is supposed to be user ID, this is supposed to be auth token, much like a parameter name. But what it wouldn't do is it would be effectively, as far as the compiler is concerned, exactly the same as a string. And so the compiler wouldn't give us any different messages. So good question. The um, using uh, type alias would not have the same effect here. Um, so not only does wrapping in a semantic type um, give us semantics to what it represents that helps us reason about and understand our code better and avoid crossing wires. But it, it gives the entry point semantics. So by wrapping early at the point of entry, when we init or when we 
um, load data from the server or when something comes in from the user typing into the input field. We can see at the point of entry, like instead of saying, oh, there's a string and it seems to be flowing through to these places and I don't really know what it represents. The moment it comes in, if we look at that little section of code, we see it being wrapped immediately and so we can, we can connect the semantics with the code that's kind of bringing it in in the first place. And when I say unwrap late, um, what are the benefits of unwrapping these, these wrappers uh, at the latest point possible? Well, the, the exit points are now made explicit and they have semantics. So what we're going to do is we're, uh, we're, even though the underlying representation might be, for example, we'll have an, an unmasked social security number in the underlying data type, we're going to be explicit about saying this is unmasked or this is masked. And being explicit about it is going to make it a lot easier to see what's going on in our code. And we're going to see at these terminal points, when we need to turn something into a primitive, we're going to see what it represents because that name will explicitly be there instead of just seeing strings flowing through everywhere. So, okay, let's fix it. Uh, let's dive into the code. So, all right, and remember, we want to change one type, follow the compiler errors, and then see no more bugs. So, um, here's our model. This is, all, this is our single source of truth for our entire application state. I'm going to define a wrapper type called SSN input. It's nothing more than a simple wrapper around the string type. I'm going to use this wrapper type in our model. So this is the one place I'm going to change a type definition. And then from here, it's up to the compiler to tell me what I need to do. So let me follow these compiler errors. OK. So the first message here, um, it's telling me SSN input here. Um, the value you're giving me is a string. But you just told me in the model that it's this SSN input thing. OK, well, it so happens I have this constructor, SSN input that allows me to get data of the type uh, SSN input when I pass in a string. So let's use that constructor function. OK, and that compiler message went away. So one down. Let's keep following through. Got saved social security number. Now, this is, uh, this is the message that comes in. So this is, uh, this is in our update function when we're telling Elm how to handle incoming messages and how to change our model. And so this is saving the data that comes back from the server when it loads an already saved social security number. Now I could make this particular message go away by wrapping it at this point. But we had the rule wrap early. We want to have that code that's wrapping it at the entry point so we can have these semantics that tell us what does this represent? And so that we can not have it represented as a string that doesn't have a clear semantic meaning at any point in the code. So um, instead of fixing it this way, I'm going to um, I'm going to push it up one level, and I'm going to do that with a little bit of wishful thinking. So if I look at this get saved social security number message, it kind of has this data that it gets. So I'm going to say, okay, well instead of getting a string here. I want you to get uh, SSN input. Now, um, now, it's, uh, now it's telling me in my JSON decoder, when I'm decoding the data um, that I get back from the server, it's saying, well, this decoder that you're using is going to give you back some type of string. Um, but you're saying you're getting this SSN input data type. So. Um, what I can do is I can fix that by using JSON decode map. So what's going to happen here is I will actually never have this as a raw string in my application. Elm will act actually decode this untyped JSON data and it'll say, okay, I'm moving this into this typed data and it'll apply this map function before it even enters my Elm code. So I'm going to just map it with this SSN input wrapper here. So that solved that error, that error. So a little bit of wishful thinking in one place led me to the point that I needed to fix in another place. Okay, changed SSN input. 
this is a similar situation. So if I just do a simple wrapper here, then it'll make the Elm compiler happy, but it doesn't satisfy the rule that I set for myself, which is to wrap early. I can wrap earlier, so I'm going to push it up one level. So again, if I look at the changed SSN input message, I can see the payload it has here is defined as a string. Let's do a little wishful typing and say, I wish it was getting an SSN input here. I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but since I'm saying that's the case, the Elm compiler will tell me where it's inconsistent and what I need to fix to make that true. So change SSN input. Now if I go here, there's this on change that's happening for my input. So uh, this is my um, on change handler for my input field. And changed SSN input, um, it's, a, it's a constructor that takes a single argument. Before it was taking a string, now it's taking this SSN input type. So um, I'm just going to rewrite this uh, instead of just having this constructor function. I'm just going to rewrite it as a lambda and then pass that argument into this function. So I didn't change anything. That's just rewriting it the same way. But now I'm going to just take the raw input and I'm just going to wrap it in SSN input. And uh, that's a little bit anticlimactic because um, there's still a compiler error in this record. <laughs> Let me just show you that it's fixed by, so um, yeah. So this uh, text field here represents the value that we're going to see in the actual input when, when uh, we see the either masked or unmasked input. This is what's in that actual uh, form input field. So Elm was complaining here because it's saying, wait a minute, um, you have these SSN input types. That's, that's not a string. Um, I need a string here. So this is for, for unwrapping. Now we're getting to unwrap late. So this is, um, this is one of those sort of terminal points where this is the latest point uh, where we actually need a primitive. We actually need a primitive because Elm needs a string to know what to display in this little input form. So um, what I need here is I need something that takes this uh, SSN input. So let me just write this out. So given, uh, so if it's in focus, then I want unmasked SSN. And I want it to take an SSN input and return a string. So this is just a simple unwrap function. And the way I can define that is just with a little bit of pattern matching. I'll just call this unmasked, if I can spell it. And then I can just apply that function. Um, OK, so, so now it's, it's happy there, but I'm, um, my masked SSN function, it's complaining because that takes a string. Well, we want our unwrapper functions to just take the wrapped value. Um, that's what our unwrapper functions are. So now this needs to be an unwrapper. So I'll just change the type here to SSN input. Um, so now this code is perfectly happy. Um, and it's telling me that something's wrong here. Um, sure enough, it, we need to actually unwrap it here. And let me just rename this to unmasked. OK. so. Did we make the compiler happy? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I messed up one step. So um, I, w I, I failed to, um, I failed to revert the code when we when we did the initial bug fix. Um, so I was so I had this bug in the code here that we're masking the social security number. That w that was not supposed to be there. So. Um, so that was a mistake. So, so the, um, what was happening was we were, we were unwrapping this point in code, and it, and it, was, it was using that unwrapper. So, um, OK, so now the compiler is telling us, you need to tell me how to turn this value into a primitive, because submit, with social, su submit social security number with status is expecting a string. But in fact, um, submit social security number with a string is just a function we're defining. 
if it's a function we're defining, then we're not unwrapping late if we're, if we're unwrapping it before we pass it to the function. We want to kick it down the road as far as we can. We want to unwrap as late as possible. So instead of unwrapping it before we pass it in as a string, let's just change the type signature to say that it gets SSN input. And then uh, we now let's look at this point. Uh, let's follow the same train of thought here. So, so show SSN submit status. Now, if we look at that, that's a port. A port in Elm is the way that you tell, you send a message out to JavaScript that says, here's some data, please do something. Um, and it turns out you can only send primitive types through ports in Elm. And therefore, this is a terminal point. We can't help but, but unwrap. So, uh, so we need to unwrap at this point. So uh, this satisfies our unwrap late rule. So we'll say, uh, when we show the submit status, we want it to be masked. So again, this is, we're explicitly saying everywhere that we unwrap this data, we're explicitly saying what it means. It's not just a string that we have to keep track of. What did that represent again at this point? What transformations has it gone through? Okay, and then send SSN to server. Um, if we look at the def definition of that, it's a function that we control, and therefore we can kick the can down the road, unwrap a little bit later, and just change the argument type to SSN input. Now if we look here, uh, we're building up a URL. This URL builder.string is just something for building up a query parameter that it's going to use when it makes the HTTP request to our server. Um, so this is like a built-in Elm function, and there's no way around it. It needs a primitive at this point. So this is the latest point that we can unwrap. So let's explicitly unwrap. And when we send it to the server, we know that it needs to be unmasked. OK. So this time, let's see what happens. And let's see if we've accomplished our goal of changing a single type, only changing things that the compiler told us to, and then fixing the bug. OK, it's masked. That's working correctly. We look here, it's masked in this little pop-up, and we get a green check mark that is persisting it successfully on the server. So um, it's mission accomplished. Um, we succeeded in, in uh, our goal. Now, yay. <laughs> uh, so now that leads us to the question, are we done? Did we, is, uh, is the legal team happy? Are we happy? Will it stay fixed now? Um, well, let's look at what we've accomplished. We've got explicit semantics. That's great. We, um, we can see at the point of entry when we're wrapping it, what does this thing represent? So if we're looking through the code and saying like, oh, I've got a decoder and it's getting this thing, what does it represent? It looks like it's just a string. No, it, we can see it represents this SSN input. So we have some idea of the semantics. That's, that's great, that's a big win. We can see the explicit semantics when we're unwrapping it, whether it's masked or unmasked. And perhaps we, uh, perhaps before we ship this to production, we're going to need to make sure that we're handling encrypting this and decrypting it when we get it back from the server, right? There are all these things to think about. Um, we're being explicit about them, so it's a lot easier to be confident that we're doing them correctly. And we're no longer passing around these primitive types all over the place. We're passing around these nice things that give semantic meaning. OK, so um, now what about um, unwrap early and wrap late? Well, the code is nicer. It's easier to reason about. Now here's the problem. We still need to remember to do it. So here's the question. Can we take what we've just done we followed a set of rules that served us really well. Now can we take those rules, which are really just a convention, and can we turn them into a compiler guarantee somehow? So essentially what we want to do is we want to take this, um, here's our application flow. These are the ways that this data can flow in, that we can get something representing the SSN input. And then in the green, we've got the ways that we can then use that social security number input. And we need to remember um, to use it correctly, and we need to remember to unwrap late and to wrap early. So if somebody new comes onto the team, are they going to remember these things if we're, you know, working in some other module? 
six months later, are we going to forget about these rules? Now, the reason I have a dotted line around this little step of storing it in the model is because this code is just wide open. There's nothing controlling it. It's, it's purely by convention. So what we'd really like to get to is sort of a one-stop shop where uh, we've got, rather than just having some helper functions that help us wrap and unwrap this data type, we want to move this into a module that we control that can help us enforce those, those guarantees. Um, so that the only way to get one is by using this module, which enforces wrapping early. And the only way to use one is through this module, which enforces wrapping late. So that way, you can't just grab the string and say, oh, I'm going to use it here. The only way to use it is in this module. So if there are no bugs in this module, then all of the consumers of it can rest easy and just use the code confidently. Um, OK, so let me uh, quickly introduce um, this concept of a, an opaque type in, in Elm. So an opaque type is just a fancy way of saying it's a type with a private constructor. So here, uh, I, I like to use this example of a positive int. How do you know that you have uh, an actual positive int represented by this, uh, by this type? Um, you, could, you could easily create a positive int with this constructor and pass a negative one. Um, well, you can start by um, putting it into a module, but still we're exposing the constructor. So we can still construct a negative integer value that we're calling a positive int, which uh, doesn't seem so good. So, um, so this uh, kind of pink thing on the left represents uh, we're defining a type. And we're exposing that type so you can use it in your annotations. And on the right, the dot dot is saying expose to the outside, outside of this module all of the constructors. There's only one. And that positive int on the right side of the equals is the constructor function. Well, an opaque type is simply when you hide that constructor from the outside world. So the only way to build one um, is through that module. So let's use that technique. And so what we want to do, I'm going to um, try to do this in small steps. So I'm going to create a module. Oh, thank you so much. I always forget to toggle. Awesome. OK. So I've got my social security number input type. What I want to do is I want to start by moving it to a module, and I'll just publicly expose everything just as a refactoring step to make my next set of steps easier. So I'm going to create a module called SSNInput.Elm. And you know I'm just going to delete this so we can see there are some errors here. I'll paste it in, and I will import social security number input, exposing SSN input and all of its one constructors. Um, so all I've done is just expose this in the top level namespace in my main.elm file. So it's, it's effectively equivalent. It's the exact same thing, but I've done a refactoring to move it into this module. OK, so now I can use this little trick to, uh, if, I, um, if I no longer expose the constructor, I can actually have the Elm compiler tell me the points where I need to um, uh, where it's not able to construct things. So I can, I can see where this um, essentially, I can find these points which I want to wrap. So my goal is to wrap these points um, where I can get a social security number input in this module. So the only way to get one is in this module and the only way to use one is from within this module. So if I hide my constructor, then the compiler tells me all of those points I need to fix. So let's go through uh, one by one, and I'm just going to um, start with a very easy one. So I'm going to uh, get back to a compiling state so that I can um, have the Elm compiler help me along a little better throughout the way. Um, OK, so we were looking at this code where we're initting it. So again, this is, uh, this is the point where how do I get one from the init function. We init it as an empty string. Um, so this is a pretty easy one. Um, I'm just going to extract this function and call it um, empty SSN. 
Um, and we can add a type annotation there. And so now, um, if I delete this, I can see that um, the compiler's not happy because it's trying to use this empty SSN. Uh, but I want to kind of incrementally move these things one by one into this module. So let me just expose empty SSN there. And let's change this to SSN and input dot empty SSN. Okay, so one down, a few more to go. Let's try that trick again. Let's see where Elm tells us. Um, okay, so now Elm is telling us um, in this JSON decoder, um, we're using our wrapper for our SSN input. And again, we want to move everything into this one-stop shop that is the only place that knows how to get an SSN input or use one. So how do we get one? Well, um, let me just undo that change. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extract this HTTP get um, call here into a little helper. Um, and let's call it um, load SSN. So this is a command that says, please load the social security number. Give it a type annotation. OK. And um, now we want to we want to decouple this function. So this is just a little refactoring technique that we're going to need to actually um, take in um, some kind of uh, message constructor. And pass it in. So it's kind of like a dependency injection type thing. And I've got this handy dandy type note. Uh, type annotation that it gives me. And so I've now decoupled it from this message, which lives in my main module, which is, which is what we want. We want it to be completely decoupled from that. Um, and, it, and it needs to be in order to compile. So again, I'm going to delete this. We can see that the compiler is complaining here. Let's add this in here. I need to import this type. OK, and let's expose it. SSN input dot load SSN. Oh, yeah, I need to import a few more things. OK, so now it's compiling again. So. We've got, is this readable? Yeah. Um, we've got init. We've moved that over to our one-stop shop module. We've got load. Um, now for input. Hey, Dylan, sorry. Um, yes. Where's that got saved SSN coming from? That, um, that is a message. Oh. Yes, oh, that's right. just a message payload that we say, when, when the server comes back with this data, please give me this message. OK, so absolutely. Um, OK, so let's use this trick again to get the Elm compiler to show us where we need to change things. Um, so we've got this on change. Um, so now we're going to need to use this same technique to wrap this. So if we wrap uh, now. Um, we can actually, there are actually two pieces here. So input, if you notice here, it's used in two spots. We can use an input to, uh, we can use an input to get a value. We can use an input to display a value. Let's start by extracting how we use an input to display a value, which is just this little text. What's the text? Well, if the input is in focus, then it's unmasked. If it's out of focus, then it's masked. Let's just make this consistent here. OK. So um, again, I'm just going to extract a function. Um, and let's call this um, SSN input text. And it actually needs SSN focus and SSN input. Oh, 
and I'm. That's right. Exactly. So we're we are going to need to to take care of that as well. Okay. So now that's compiling. Now that's extractable. Do an import. Um, so we're going to need to move these in as well. So we're going to need to, uh, we can move in our unmasked and masked helpers. And that might have been easier to do um, in an earlier step. But now we've got uh, everything compiling here again. We can make sure everything gets exported. We can go to our SS and input text. Um, we can now delete this and refer to that in our SS and input module. OK, so um, I'm afraid that I am um, going over on time. So let me just try to, um, to wrap up uh, conceptually here a little bit. So um, essentially, um, we didn't we didn't finish the refactoring, but I, I think you've seen the process that what we're, what we're accomplishing here is we're uh, we're taking our process of having a um, having these rules to wrap early, unwrap late, give semantics to these types for what they represent, so we don't have an imperative debugging process where we have to step through and keep track of which transformations have happened, what do these primitives, these strings represent along the way. By wrapping it in a semantic type um, and following the rules to wrap early, unwrap late, we're able to, to debug in a much less imperative way and we're able to really actually just apply that technique to just go through and fix a bug by making it explicit what we're doing and making our code um, easier to follow and easier to write. And then finally, we went through and we tried to take the rule for how to unwrap early, wrap late, and take that from a convention that we follow as developers or as a team and turn it into a compiler guarantee. Um, so uh, that's all. I'll let everybody go to the next session and, and I'll stick around for questions. Thank you so much.